Hi, I'm Steve Maxwell, and welcome to Practical Living, the video show that covers home improvement, woodworking, power tools, gardening, hands-on rural living, and lots more. In this first episode of the show, I'm going to be telling you about homes that use half the energy of comparable houses built to code. We'll see some beef cattle arriving at our place for the summer pasturing season. I'll show you the best way to refinish furniture. You'll learn how to get the most from pressure washing, choose a backup generator for automatic power during a blackout, and see a great tool in action, and you can enter to win it too. So let's get started. In the first section of the show, I'm going to be answering some reader questions that have come in by email. If you have any questions, send them to me at steve at stevemaxwell.ca and I'll do my best to work them into the show. You'll see contact information in the top comment pinned below. So the first question is from Anne. Good morning, Steve. We're very interested in building a SIPS home at our place, not too far from you, just past Blind River, Ontario. Could you please share with us the closest SIPS manufacturer and designer that you've used in the past, or anyone that you would suggest for this project? Well, first of all, the acronym SIPS stands for Structural Insulated Panels. And this is a completely different way of building homes and workshops and such. Uh, instead of uh, a stick frame building with, with studs and plates and rafters and things, SIPS homes are built with panels. The acronym SIPS, as I said, starts, stands for Structural Insulated Panels. And it's essentially a factory-made sandwich with foam in the middle and sheet goods on either side. So the foam is typically three and a half to maybe ten and a half inches thick. And the sheet goods that are glued to that foam are usually oriented strand board, OSB. Uh, you build these with these something like you'd build a house of cards, essentially. Uh, there are no studs, there's no wood framing or anything. You just simply stack the panels one next to the other to form walls and you can actually use the same panels to form the roof without rafters, making a great fully usable attic. These panels fit together with notches along the, along the sides and what's called a spline, which is a, a piece that fits into the notches and stabilizes one panel to the other. So it's a great system. I've built a number of buildings using SIPs. I've recommended it to others. They've built with it. They're really happy. Uh, why would anyone want to build with SIPs? Well, I guess the biggest reason is energy efficiency. There was a study done not so long ago in southern Ontario where two identical homes were built side by side by the same crew. One house was built using conventional methods, following building codes with all the regular amount of insulation in the walls and ceiling, and the other home, identical in floor plan, built by the same people, was built in exactly the same way except SIPS panels were used for the walls. Now, in this case, probes and analysis of the two different homes was ongoing after they were built, so we know exactly how much energy they consumed for different temperatures outside. And the bottom line is quite simple. The, the SIPS version of the house used half the energy of the other house. The really interesting thing, too, is that the SIPS home, technically speaking, had somewhat less R value in the walls than the other home built with stick frame and bad insulation. Uh, and this gets to the point that not all R values are the same. Some are much more effective functionally in the real world because the R values you see published on packaging comes from lab analysis, not real world conditions. And in real world conditions, there can be an enormous difference in how the same R value performs. So uh, I suspect Anne has written me because of the energy uh, benefits that SIPs can offer. And I would certainly encourage her to, uh, to pursue that. It's, it's a real thing, it makes a real difference. Uh, SIPs homes actually happen to be stronger than stick frame too, which is kind of strange because you'd think that a wood frame would, would make things stronger, but it's not so. A, a, a SIPs structure is roughly three times as strong as a, a comparable stick frame version. I've seen photos of uh, of homes in the Caribbean. They get hit regularly with hurricanes and things. Uh, there's one home in particular. It has been through three hurricanes 
more or less unscathed, whereas all the other stick frame houses around it have been destroyed three separate times as these, as these storms have, have uh, landed. So there's lots of reason to, to use them. Uh, when I have bought these panels, I've bought them from a company called Thermapan. They're in Fort Erie, Ontario. They've been in business a long time. They do a great job. And um, there may be other manufacturers closer to you. I would be careful though, there are manufacturers of panels and that's who you'd like to deal with directly. There's also retailers of panels and they're taking their cut. So it's gonna be more expensive that way. So connecting with an actual manufacturer is the way to go. Uh, and if you're wondering about costs, uh, building a SIPS home costs maybe 2% more than a regular place. Um, it's, it's more expensive. It, it's, it's more expensive than that when you look just at the wall structure comparing stick frame to, to SIPS. Um, but when you look at the overall cost of the house, you're looking at a couple of percent of extra cost. Really very minimal for the extra strength, but more importantly, the, the energy efficiency. Now, uh, another bonus is that building with SIPS is really simple. It's a lot easier and requires less skill to put up a SIPS wall than a stud frame wall. Uh, so any carpenter can do it. Um, they're going to have to learn a few very simple different skills than they're used to. Uh, two additional tools are required, things that most carpenters probably have never used. Uh, one is some sort of a tool to cut the panels, which can get fairly thick sometimes. What I use is called a Prazzi beam cutter. This is an attachment that goes onto a regular circular saw. It replaces the blade with a short little chainsaw style bar. So now you've got great uh, cutting depth. Um, so that's not expensive and it can be uh, added to any, pretty well any circular saw. So that's one unique tool that will be needed. Another unique tool is called a hot knife. And that's to reestablish the recessed edges on panels if you've cut that recessed edge off for whatever reason, because you have to cut a panel to, to a certain length or certain width. And um, that foam needs to be recessed back from the edges of, of the sheet goods so that the spline, the thing that, that connects one panel to the other can fit into that space. So hot knives are available, uh, they're not a big deal. I, I, to, to be honest, I think the world needs a better hot knife than, than we've got now. Um, the only reasonable one that I know of is, it, it could be a little hotter, could be a little faster, but there are tricks to, to, uh, to make that recessing process work better. Uh, so, you know, that's the bottom line. Find a supplier that makes sense. You know, for Ann here, I think Fort Erie makes the most sense, but you could be watching this from anywhere in the world, and uh, certainly there are going to be local suppliers in your area too, but it is, it is definitely the way to go. Anne is going to be really pleased with that house when she finally gets done with it. So, uh, Next question comes from Brian. Good morning, Steve. We have recently acquired a 1920 to 1930 rocking chair, which has been in an attic for about 50 years. The finish is very coarse and feels like sandpaper through exposure to the attic temperature variations and possibly some dampness, although no signs of mold. Sounds promising. I would like to refinish it, but have no idea what would be the best way. Someone suggested I paint it, but I'm very loath to do that. Once painted, there's no going back. It has a very nice carving on the backrest. Any advice would be very much appreciated. Well, uh, I agree with you, Brian. I would not paint that. Uh, two reasons. Like you say, once you've painted it, it's a huge pain to remove that paint again if you want to um, renew the natural wood finish. Uh, but more importantly than that, who wants to have a painted rocking chair that feels like sandpaper? Um, clearly this old finish has deteriorated in a, in a, a not that unusual way. It, it's not unusual to see uh, old finishes go kind of crinkly and rough. So I would recommend a, a two-step approach to preparing the rocking chair for refinishing. First, you want to chemically strip off any old finish that's there. Uh, once upon a time, chemical stripping involved products that contain methylene chloride, which is pretty nasty stuff, and really, you can still buy it, but technically it should only be used outdoors. Not even in a building with an open window is there enough ventilation to protect you. Um, 
Now, thankfully, there are much friendlier and, in fact, more effective strippers that are on the market now. Um, some of them are based on uh, citrus solvents. Uh, one that I have used is, involves a, a soya bean product, believe it or not. Um, these things smell a lot less than the methylene chloride. They're much safer and they actually work better because unlike methylene chloride um, strippers, these ones stay wet. They're kind of a jelly or a thick liquid and you brush it on, but they stay wet for a long time and it's the wetness that indicates that it's working. The methylene chloride stuff is effective at first for a short time, but then it dries up quickly. And once it's dried, it's not going to work anymore. So you want to tackle that ugly old finish first with um, some kind of a stripper. Um, you're going to want to get a bunch of um, pretty heavy paper shop towels so you can wipe and work around the spindles and the handles. Um, maybe a, a little bit of light scraping. But one thing you want to do is to, you don't want to go through what's called the patina of the old finish. So this would be a, a natural darkening of the wood that takes place slowly over decades. And it, and it gives that antique look. So you don't want to get down to bare bright wood, which, which you could do if you stripped too vigorously. So do what you can with a stripper. That's going to remove 90-95% of the gunk that's giving you grief now. Uh, and then follow up with um, some kind of um, uh, non-woven rubbing pad. I use stuff from 3M. It works really well, especially on your project, because there are all kinds of round surfaces. Um, sandpaper maybe for the flatter surfaces, but nothing too coarse. I wouldn't use anything more than, say, 180. If that proves too too soft, too um, gentle, then try 150, but I wouldn't go any coarser than that. That might be fine for the seat, maybe the back of the back, flattish areas like that. The, uh, the rubbing pads are going to be much better for getting right back down to a, a clean surface that still has the patina on it. So now you've got your, your, your chair, you've got rid of that ugly sort of rough sandpaper thing, what are you going to do with it now? Well, if this were my chair, I would be finishing it with something called Wipe On Poly. This is a fairly unique product. It's made by Minwax, and it's essentially a, a very low viscosity urethane. Uh, but unlike regular urethane, which you, you brush on and, and form a kind of a film on the wood, uh, you put on the Wipe On Poly, you let it soak in, and then you gently wipe off any excess. That, that exists above the surface and then set the chair aside and let it dry. Uh, I usually leave it for a day or so. Um, the, the, the wipe on poly is kind of like finishing oil except it's better and more reliable in that it, it dries quicker and harder and with a little more strength. Now you're still going to have to put on at least three coats of this because it doesn't actually develop much protection with just one coat. It, um, it does take a while to build up sufficient protection. And I think you may find that after that first coat has dried, the chair feels somewhat rougher than it did when you started with the, the wipe on poly. That's normal. That's what's called raised grain. So the, the, the fibers of the wood grain that were laying flat before you put on the wipe on poly, they, they uh, absorb the liquid and then they stand upright this is all on a microscopic level, of course. They stand upright and then they harden that way. So you're going to feel a, probably feel a little bit of, of additional roughness. That's where you go back with the, with the rubbing pads again. Doesn't take very much, just a couple of passes in any given spot. And now you've got a nice smooth surface again. Vacuum the chair because there's going to be little bits of uh, stuff left behind by your rubbing. Vacuum it all off, make it surgically clean, and then another coat of wipe on poly. That one probably won't raise the grain since you've already raised the grain and knocked it back again. So give it maybe three coats in total, uh, maybe a fourth if you want some, some extra, extra protection. But you're going to end up with a really nice chair. It's going to look great. Uh, just one other thing, Wipe On Poly, like a lot of urethane products, comes in um, a matte version, uh, satin I think they call it, so not very glossy, and then a gloss version. Uh, I really like matte finishes uh, on everything, not just furniture, walls, you know, like interior 
painting, stuff like that. The reason is because non-glossy surfaces show up imperfections much less frequently, uh, much less obviously. So um, that's my recommendation. I think you'll be really pleased and uh, it's certainly going to be worth the effort, especially if, uh, as it appears here, you've got some attachment to it. So, um, so I hope this helps. Now, as I said, if you've got questions, email them to me at steve at stevemaxwell.ca. Um, I will look at them, work them into future episodes of the show, and um, would love to help you answer your questions and do a better job at, you know, with your hands on life. Next question comes from Sandra. And she writes, Hi Steve, with a few recent power outages under our belts, we're wondering how best to move forward. We live in a rural area and worry about our basement flooding if the sump pump doesn't have electricity. That's a very valid concern, Sandra. We currently have a backup battery and have a portable generator that my husband uses to keep us from flooding. My concern is what happens if we're away or if I'm here alone and unable to start the generator. We're wondering about options. We do not have water during a power outage as we have a well and in warmer weather we can make do but worry about a prolonged outage in winter. Well, that's a, a valid concern as people in the country, no electricity, no running water. Uh, we've heard of Generac but have been told that they're very expensive, maybe $11,000 to install and can blow through hundreds of dollars of propane quite quickly. What, are, what other options are out there? It seems like this is on the minds of many, with climate change wondering the wisest way to proceed. Well, Generac is a brand name of what is called generically uh, automatic backup generators. And this is something I would recommend for you despite the concerns that you have, have offered here. Uh, these are um, stationary enclosed uh, devices that sit outside your home. They're connected to a fuel source. That's either propane where you live or if a person has natural gas, you can connect to that as well. And then there are some uh, cables leading to your house and a separate panel, electrical panel in your house. Now, um, these things come on automatically. If the grid goes down, they shut themselves off automatically when the grid comes back and they provide very complete power, um, basically almost everything that you, you could use in your house, depending on the size of the stationary backup generator. I mean, some are small. You might have to pick and choose what you use when that thing is providing you with power. Um, others are large and you probably wouldn't have to change your lifestyle at all. Um, $11,000 to install, I think that's a little on the high side. Um, they have, these units have gotten a lot cheaper uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. A lot of people are getting them. So you won't find a more reliable, secure way of protecting your, your basement from flooding if you're not around or your husband's not around to connect the generator. As far as operating costs go, um, operating any generator is going to be much more expensive for a unit of power created compared with the grid. Um, the grid is, um, it's got some problems, it's got some vulnerabilities, but in terms of providing cheap power, it's, it's an excellent option. It really um, does deliver that way. So I have two recommendations for you. One recommendation would be to go with a backup generator. That's going to be your once and for all solution. Um, if you bite the bullet and, and pay the cost, I don't think you'll regret that at all. And don't forget too that the amount of fuel that a generator consumes is somewhat proportional to the amount of power you're demanding. So now, yes, the generator is going to fire up and it's going to run full blast whether you are using just a 100 watt light bulb or roasting a turkey. The generator is going to be running at the same speed, but that doesn't mean it's consuming the same amount of fuel. The harder you work that generator, the more fuel it's going to have to burn in order to maintain its RPM. So there is a proportion there. It's not like if you use no power and your generator is running, you're not using any fuel because you are using some. But um, you know the, the worry you have about this thing sucking back vast amounts of fuel, um, you don't really have to worry about that. It really comes down to how much electricity you use and also how long the outage is, of course. But it sounds like you're concerned 
and a stationary backup generator is going to satisfy that concern perfectly. Now there are there are backup sump pumps that have a, a built-in battery and they will run for a number of hours after the power goes out. But a number of hours might not be enough. I mean, as you probably recognize, uh, it's one thing to keep the water at bay for a few hours, but when that battery dies, then, you know, you might as well not have had a sump pump. So there are additional backup battery banks that you can use for this sort of thing. And they're becoming more and more common. Uh, they're generically called portable power stations. And they're essentially a high output lithium battery in a case with an inverter and other control equipment that allows you to basically just carry uh, AC power around in your hand and, and, to, uh, and, and to use it wherever you want. And you can use it for other things too. These portable power stations are great for providing um, charging capabilities for your phone, your computer. Uh, I ran a test on one recently uh, specifically to see how long it would uh, it would run a water pump, a, a rural water well pump like the kind you have. And I found that a fully charged unit, moderate size, will keep that water pump going uh, for a day. Now it's not running constantly of course, the, the water pump only comes on as you need water. But um, that's another option and it could be used, it could be left connected to your sump pump to provide a whole bunch of additional backup power for that pump beyond any battery that might be part of the sump pump's own system um, and expand things that way. But um, other than those two options, I think that's pretty well it. The, um, I would certainly urge you to consider that, that backup generator. I think it's going to give you the best, the best bang for the buck. Coming up next in the tools and workshop section of the show, I'm going to show you a great new kind of cordless power tool. It's a little miniature chainsaw and it's made for pruning. And I've really come to love these things. I do a lot of pruning around our place, pruning, cutting up biggish branches for firewood, things like that. You really can't beat them for speed and they're fairly safe too, even though they are a little chainsaw. So let's go and take a look see how one works. So this is a pruning saw. I first saw another manufacturer's version of this a few years ago and I've been uh, using these kinds of tools uh, pretty often uh, for trimming branches and cutting up small pieces of wood. It's, it's really handy. Uh, little wee chainsaw bar. This one's an eight inch bar. Another brand has a six inch bar. I've seen three manufacturers that make these so far. We're probably going to see quite a bit quite a few more um, just because it fills a, a gap in the cordless tool scene for the kind of work you're going to see me doing here and um, it's fairly safe uh, a lot safer than a chainsaw just because the bar is so much smaller I've also found that the chains uh, stay sharp a long time probably because they never ever get it near any dirt because um, you're, you're pruning away you're not cutting logs on the ground like you might with a chainsaw uh, this one has a nose guard to stop the, the end of the tool from touching anything or kicking back or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's fairly safe as these things go. I'm going to show you how it works on a branch that needs trimming. But uh, before I do, I've got to fill up the reservoir here. So a chainsaw takes gas mixed with oil for the engine and then a separate reservoir of oil for the, to lubricate the chain. Of course, this doesn't need gasoline, but it does need chain lubrication. So, depending on the battery size, you will need to uh, top up this reservoir maybe after every battery change or two. Keep your eye on it. it it's, it's easy to let it run dry because you don't have an engine running out of gas to tell you you need more chain oil too. So it uh, comes with a fairly small battery, just three amp hour, but it can take much larger batteries. And the larger battery is not gonna give you any more power really, but it is gonna give you a lot more run time. Um, oh, before I forget, I've got a brand one, new one of these in a box, ready to give away to a lucky winner. So be sure you enter the contest. Um, d details are in the top in the top comment of the, uh, the video down below. So let's go and cut a branch and see how it works. Uh, 
Now this is a fairly long branch and I want to give you a little tip. Ultimately I want to cut it flush to the trunk but chances are very good that if I do that now when the branch comes down it's going to tear a strip of bark off the trunk and I don't want to do that. So whenever I trim branches I always trim a ways back from where I ultimately want to trim because you know if any funny business happens here the bark gets damaged it's no big deal. So I'll start here and then I'll make a second cut to remove the trunk uh, the branch right close to the trunk. Pretty fast, huh? There. It's done. Now, I'm going to be um, trimming this because I've got a wood chipper, a big tractor mounted wood chipper. That's how I get rid of branches like this. It turns waste into a useful mulch. But uh, just got another couple of cuts here to make it smaller and more handle handleable. Now that, that chain's cutting pretty fast because it's a new chain, but I have used tools like this sometimes for two, a couple of seasons and not had to resharpen the chain at all. As I said, it lasts a long time, probably because it sticks, stays out of the dirt. Um, but a handy tool, you're gonna see this come up more and more often. I've recommended these tools to people who've come to me and said, I got some branches to trim, a whole bunch of brush to take care of. Something like this does a really good job. It's a regular part of my tool kit right now. Coming up next in the on the land section of the show, I want to show you some beef cattle. Uh, they've arrived at our place for the 2023 pasture season. Uh, and it's just great to see them come out and enjoy the grass. And so let's take a look at the honking big trailer that brought them here. Uh, we have 43 head on our land this year and uh, I, I think you'll smile when you see these young cattle go out and start enjoying some real grass and fresh air. So let's take a look. So here you can see my uh, friend and pasture partner Jim arriving with his cattle trailer. Uh, he managed to get 16 head into each load. I said earlier we're going to have 43, it's actually 53 that we're going to have, or we do have now, actually. And um, Jim is bringing these cattle from a barn. They were born in the fall. So um, this is all new to them. They've never seen pasture before, um, but they don't need to have seen it to enjoy it when they get here. And if you look closely in the middle, I'm just walking out there, opening up the gate for him to go in. Um, if you look at the, the top of the screen, you can just catch a little bit of some of the cattle that are here already. Um, it takes, you know, three full loads and a part load to get that 53 that we're going to have this year. Leaves are about half out at this stage, which is usually the time when we, when the grass is long enough to start pasturing. That's one thing, you don't want to put the cattle out too soon. Um, you want the grass to have a chance to have started growing and also the soil to be dry enough so that they're not punching up the pasture and killing a lot of plants unnecessarily. Our pasture has dried out much more quickly this year because a couple of years ago we had some uh, tile drainage uh, installed. Uh, that's going to make a big difference. That is making a big difference already. The uh, prized pasture plants are are hanging on longer. Uh, they're, they're not dying out in the winter because they're submerged in water from all those fall rains um, and then things grow better. You can also get the cattle out on the land sooner because it dries out more quickly too. Now you well you may be able to see this uh, just going upwards diagonally to the left from the truck you can just see a fine white line. That's a single ribbon of electric fence tape um, that I will use, uh, I, will, I will extend it all the way to the lilac hedge that you see at the bottom 
uh, in order to divide the pasture. But right now, that first field is open. Uh, it's five acres in all. And uh, here Jim's letting the cattle out. As I said, they've never been in a trailer before, so it's all kind of new to them. Uh, average weight on these is 591 pounds. And um, sometimes it takes them a while to, to figure out how to get out of the trailer. As I said, it's all new to them. Now, at the top of the screen, you'll see some of the cattle that are already here. They, they see something's going on, and they're coming over to investigate. Whenever you put cattle on pasture like this, it takes them a few days to get settled down. Cattle are sensitive creatures, really. Um, sensitive and wary. So you have to earn their trust. I'll go out and inspect them with a bucket of grain. They'll come to associate me with grain, so they'll, um, they won't run from me once they get to know me. An, an interesting thing here, that corner of the first field where they're gathering now, it's very common for cattle to come off the trailer and go to that corner and just kind of sit there and figure out what's going on. Even though, from year to year, the animals are different. They've never seen that spot, but it just seems to attract them. Um, you'll also notice the, uh, the zigzag cedar rail fence. We call that a snake rail fence. It's a traditional way of fencing on Manitoulin. Most of our cattle pasture is fenced with cedar rails. I have learned over the years to put a single electric wire on both sides of that fence too, just as an added deterrent so the cattle won't rub up against the fence. A couple of years ago, I had a section that didn't have a wire on it and they, they rubbed their way right through the fence and 56 had disappeared in the forest for two and a half weeks. I mean, that's, that's over $100,000 worth of cattle, so that was an interesting time. I searched for them diligently, never found them, never saw them, for two and a half weeks, although I did see signs of them. Some of them were five, six kilometers away, uh, some down by the Lake Huron shoreline, other ones were by a swamp. But thank goodness, one night, they just all showed up again. Coming up next in the show, in the Better Homes section, I'm going to be showing you about pressure washers and covering three tips for getting the most out of yours. And I bet you probably haven't thought of all of them, so let's go and let me show you what I mean. My first tip is to outfit your hoses and such with a quick-release fitting. I really like the, the all-metal ones. They, they work really well. Then turn on the water, and without the tip in place, without the, uh, the, the angled pressure-producing tip, just let the water flow. That fills the pump with water, but it also makes sure there's no sediment that would clog the nozzle. Uh, clogged nozzles can be a real pain and once you do uh, the purging you won't have to worry about that. Tip number two is to be really careful when you're washing a surface that matters and you've never really washed it before. Uh, the reason being that is that uh, pressure washers can leave marks behind on surfaces, squiggly marks um, because of the way you move the wand and they won't become apparent until the surface dries. Now in this case, I'm just washing off an old manure spreader, so uh, if I leave squiggly marks behind on the tires, it doesn't really matter, but, but look at that. Uh, if that was your deck or your walkway or anything you like, you wouldn't be too pleased. So this, this next tip, the third tip, has to do with winterizing your pressure washer, because unless you can store these things indoors during winter. Uh, Water is going to remain in the pump and it will freeze and crack um, uh, during winter and you definitely don't want to have that happen. Uh, pumps are notoriously difficult to drain. They don't usually come with a drain plug or anything so you need to displace the water with something that won't freeze. And in this case I'm using non-toxic plumbing antifreeze. Uh, I've got a funnel rigged up with a hose that Go, that attaches to what's normally the water inlet port. So you fill up, the, uh, fill up the funnel, let it flow in. This alone is not enough though. You need to actually um, pull the starter cord. You'd have the ignition switch off, of course, because you don't want the thing to start. But pulling the cord will encourage circulation of the antifreeze through the system 
and you just do this a few times until you can start seeing some pink antifreeze coming through. Once that's done, you know you won't have any trouble with your pump cracking uh, over winter as you store your washer outside. Coming up in the next episode of Practical Living, I'm going to be talking to you about a deck finish gone wonky and how to fix it. Uh, I'm going to tell you the ugly truth about building wrap and an alternative that I much prefer to that. I'm going to show you my big, fat, powerful wood chipper in action on my 60 horsepower tracker, just gobbling up chips and shavings. And I'm going to show you how I use that um, in my pasture to actually improve the pasture, make it more productive, and keep the trees back from growing in around the fences. And finally, I'm going to show you uh, my, my ATV, my four-wheeler, and now I have it decked out for providing all the tools I need when I'm out away from the house in the shop, dealing with things in the forest and on my pasture field. So, see you next time.